God loves you. He has things for you. He designed you in his image. People don't don't sometimes really, they, they're words that you say, but they don't really realize that. Uh, in, in God's image is imagination. The expanse of his imagination is my imagination too, and I have a right to use that imagination. So people always say, well, that was my idea. No, ideas are just circulating in the universe. I think when you when you get in touch with the deeper levels of life in yourself, that you tune into a vibration that's present throughout the universe. It's a spiritual way of thinking. We are part of a movement called New Thought, which, by the way, no one has heard of. We're labeling things all the time, and it's funny that we even call this thing New Thought because it's been around forever. It's actually it's a, it's a process of remembering what we already know. It's all about our thoughts creating our lives and our being one with God. And there's nothing really new about it. It's just a new presentation of an ancient concept. It's uh, known by, by other names or no name at all in many countries by many people. New thought is not just about sitting and thinking. New thought is about mind power, it's about heart power, it's about spirituality. It's actually about being one with the divine and raising your thoughts from a human egocentric consciousness, one to a divine consciousness. And in that expanded awareness is a new intuition, a new insight, a new imagination, new contexts, new meanings, new stories. Our belief is to give, to, to encourage, and to encourage a person to be the best person he or she can be, to be a person of love and harmony and peace and support and belief in the goodness of humanity. There's a whole philosophy, there's a whole point of view. There are saints and sages and mystics and prophets and living masters and Oprah's and Michael Bethwick's and, and amazing souls on the planet carrying this light, carrying this forward. People may not even be recognizing that they're that they're watching something about new thought. New thought may permeate almost everything because it is a chameleon and it's really uh, compatible with almost anything and everything. New Thought is, uh, you know, this wonderful and rich uh, tradition that extends really to the first century of Christianity and, uh, you know, even further back than that. Uh, but it has its uh, conglomeration of energies that occurred really within the 20th century of American history when the Transcendentalist movement kind of merged with the, uh, what, I, what I call and define as the Mind Cure movement along with progressive Christianity. Uh, and those three circles together mixed in a unique way in early American history in the 1800s that gave birth to this thing that we call the New Thought Movement now, which includes unity and religious science and centers for spiritual living uh, and many other groups. Uh, but behind all of even that is this backdrop of universal spiritual principles, universal truths and ancient wisdom uh, that we find in Hermes and Plato and uh, the Greek mythologies and uh, Taoism, and Lao Tzu and the Buddha. Uh, so it's really a, a conglomeration of the great wisdom of the ages. So it was in the 19th century that there began to be a revolution of consciousness. People became more conscious of the subconscious mind, of the power of their thoughts upon themselves and their environment and the world. Uh, what you see in the late 1800s uh, was the writing of these ideas began to be formed by uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau and these people who gathered at Walden Pond. Uh, they began to write about these ideas of the mystical self, the transcendental self, the awakening self, as being not just for the mystics, but for everybody. And that there was a way to get direct contact to that. 
So that writing really began with the Transcendentalists in the late 1800s. Let's look at what was happening in Maine. There was Phineas Parkhurst Quimby, and he had been studying Anton Mesmer, who was traveling and, and, and lecturing in Europe. And it was then called Mesmerism after him. The word hypnotism hadn't yet come about. He really sort of discovered that if people thought they would be better, then they would be better. You know, he started, he used to use, it's so interesting, he started his ministry using magnets. And, and then he realized one day when he was going to do this healing demonstration, he forgot his magnets. And so he did the demonstration and it still worked. And so that's when he realized it's not the magnets, it's the mind. And Phineas Quimby came along and saw what Mesmer was doing and decided this use of hypnosis and mesmerizing to get to the subjective consciousness, to the, to the, to the uh, a level of consciousness that is underneath our conscious thought, is a way to heal. And so Phineas Quinby created a healing uh, science about all of this. Now, Phineas Quimby is uh, given the honor of being the man who brought new thought to uh, America. And he was originally a clock maker. He, he began uh, to question, because of his own health, Phineas Quimby's, whether Jesus meant that you could actually do this for oneself. So he, while literally walking his horse and buggy, decided that he could heal himself. He invoked these very principles, healed himself, and then he began healing people and that's why he became known as Dr. Quimby, not because he ever uh, required a medical license, but because he kept healing people. People who, who by the way, medically licensed people could not heal. Phineas Quimby took these principles and was able to actually uh, create physical healing, uh, overcame tuberculosis at a time when that was a death sentence. Well, Phineas P. Quimby was a, a very curious, as most new thought people are, a very curious man who studied many things in order to find truth. He was on a search for truth. He learned from a, a man who was essentially a trance medium how to do hypnotic suggestion in terms of uh, affecting a mental cure. And he took it to a, a more deeply spiritual level. He was able to access the subconscious mind and find the power not only of bringing forth what was in somebody's subconscious mind, but being able to positively affect them for their health and well-being. And he practiced it based on that mesmerism until he began to find out that the foundation of it was not in hypnotism, but it was in people being able to be transform in the way in which they thought. And if they changed the way that they thought, they could change the circumstances and conditions of their life. He wanted people to understand that their mind was creating their reality. And he had a famous phrase that said, the explanation is the cure. So he wanted people to come to hear his explanation so they could be healed. But how, did, how do you get people into the room? He wrote up a flyer, a broadsheet, an advertisement. He had it printed. He would distribute it. And very often it had one of the most powerful words in marketing right on it, free talk. Free is powerful. So people would come to the talk there, he would give his presentation, he would give his demonstration, and very often he used hypnosis, he used mind power, he used the new thought philosophy that he was creating and developing in order to help people. He never began a movement of any kind, but by the way, one of his most famous patients, as you probably know, was a, a lady by the name of Mary Baker Eddy and she had a wonderful healing, and she began a spiritual movement, as you know, called Christian Science. Well, Mary Baker Eddy, you know, she went, she heard of what Phineas Parker Squimby was doing in his healing methods. She went to him for healing. She was healed uh, through his uh, methods of what today we would refer to as affirmative prayer, spiritual mind treatment, and uh, these sorts of uh, affirmative consciousness methods. She began to uh, go to scripture herself and to study these ideas, correspond them with the healing and teachings of Jesus, 
uh, began to write and began to teach other people these same methods. She became very popular uh, and a great teacher of, of many and created her own movement, what today is the Christian Science uh, Movement. Mary was very convinced uh, that these ideas were her ideas, that she had received kind of a divine revelation from spirit, uh, that she was the articulator of these, this movement uh, called Christian Science. And she denied, in fact, for a while that she even knew Quimby or that was ever even healed by him. Of course, this is obviously way before the days of emails and Google and all of these other things. And so, uh, so people believed her. People believed when she said, this is my divine idea they took her at, her at her word and there was a big controversy uh, after Quimby's death that they actually found letters, letters that she wrote to Quimby thanking him uh, for uh, his healing work. So she eventually did admit that she knew Quimby, she knew of his work, but that hers was different and special. What, what happened within the Christian Science Church was an unusual piece of religious dogma and that is that uh, Mary Baker Eddy decided that these ideas were hers uh, and not universal ideas. Whereas uh, where the other mystics, the transcendentalists and the like, who had been coming, coming, uh, ma being made aware through their own evolution of these ideas, uh, they, most of us have discovered, of course, that they belong to everybody. Christian science came before any of the others. And Mary Baker Eddy has been highly criticized because she was very controlling, but she was a woman going into a man's world teaching something new. But she was the one who took it out and created an organization. And if you ever read her life story, she went through some very, very hard times in doing it. Among her star students was a woman uh, named Emma Curtis Hopkins, who became the first editor of the Christian Science uh, magazine. And Emma had some of her own ideas, also being a very brilliant woman of the 20th century. And instead of just publishing what Mary told her to publish, Emma began to uh, articulate some of her own ideas and put some of those ideas in the newsletters. And that became very controversial for Mary. So Emma was excommunicated um, uh, by Mary Baker Eddy, as well as many other individuals were. Several of her teachers left Christian Science uh, and became independent teachers. So there was that influence in the early New Thought movement uh, had come from Christian science, and then the teachers who left became independent thinkers and teachers in their own right. Emma Curtis Hopkins and Mary Baker Eddy went their separate ways. Emma Curtis Hopkins has now taken Mary Baker Eddy's ideas with Quimby's ideas that came, actually can trace all their lineage back to Plato and before. All of those ideas and she began to teach ways that people could change their lives, ways people could heal their lives. Emma was infamous for saying that all is life, all is life. There was such a pure, direct, absolutist ideal about Emma in terms of the power of mind. And so that kind of influence went off in its direction and spawned a whole nother uh, amazing, amazing offshoot of New Thought. And they included Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, um, who founded Unity, uh, Melinda Kramer, uh, Nona Brooks, and others um, who founded Divine Science, and eventually Ernest Holmes, who founded Religious Science. Um, she also had um, various writers, um, New Thought writers, um, including H. Emily Cady, who wrote Lessons in Truth for Unity, um, Ella Wheeler Wilcox, who was a writer, and a number of other folks. Other groups were spe spreading throughout the country, doing their own teaching and healing, and all of them began uh, to attract around this new label called New Thought. And that began to attract an audience. Obviously, modern medicine wasn't very modern at that time. So alternative healing methods were, were very popular. Those began to cross boundaries and blend with various forms of Christianity. And then people who were in, interested in alternative spirituality as well. So all of that began to be the soup and the mix that uh, gave birth to this new thing and the first New Thought uh, movements and what we today would call denominations 
uh, began to appear in the early uh, 1900s.